series of three pictures of a so-called double star. There's a third star, fortunately, in the picture, so you can see that they're really turning around and that nobody just simply turned the frames of the pictures around, which is easy to do on astronomical pictures. But the stars are actually going around. And by watching these things and plotting the orbit, you see the orbit that they make on the next slide. It's, it's evident that they're attracting each other and that they're going around in an ellipse. According to the way expected, these are a succession of pictures uh, going for all these different periods of time. I think, yes, it goes around this way. And they didn't see it well when it was too close. And here it is in 1905. My slide is very old. It's gone around maybe once more since. And you'll be happy except when you notice, if you have noticed already, that the center is not an a focus of the ellipse, but it's quite a bit off. So something's the matter with the law. No. It, God hasn't presented us with this orbit face on. It's tilted at a funny angle. And if you take an ellipse and mark its focus and then hold the paper at an odd angle and look at it in projection, this, the, the focus doesn't have to be at the focus of the projected image. So it's uh, because its orbit is tilted in space that it looks that way. It looks like it's not the right pattern. But it's all right, and you can figure everything out satisfactorily for that. How about a, diff a bigger distance? There's forces between the stars. Does it go any further? than these distances which are not more than two or three times the solar system's diameter. Here's something in the next slide that's 100,000 times as big as the solar system in diameter. And this is a large number of stars, tremendous number of stars. This white spot is not a solid white spot. It's just because of the failure of our instruments to resolve it. But our very, very tiny dots, just like the other stars, well separated from one another, not hitting each other, each one falling through and back and forth through this great globular cluster. It's one of the most beautiful things in the sky, as good as sea waves and sunset. And the distribution of this material, it's perfectly clear that the thing that holds this together is the gravitational attraction of the stars for each other. And the distribution of the material in the sense of how the stars peter out as you go out in distance permits one to find out roughly how, what the law is of force between the stars, and of course it comes out right that it is roughly the inverse square. The accuracy of these calculations and measurements is not anywhere near as careful as in the solar system. Onward, as gravity extends still further. This is a little pinpoint inside of a big galaxy, and the next slide shows a typical galaxy. And it's clear that this thing again is held together somehow, and the only candidate that's reasonable is gravitation. But when we get to this, con this size, we haven't any way any longer to check the inverse square law. But there seems to be no doubt that these great agglomerations of stars and so, these galaxies, which are 50 to 100,000 light years across, the solar system is, well, from uh, the Earth to the Sun is only eight light minutes. This is 100,000 light years that the gravity is extending even over these distances. And in the next slide is evidence that it extends even further. Here is what is called a cluster of galaxies. There's a galaxy here and here and here. There are galaxies here. They're all in one lump of galaxies, analogous to the cluster of stars. But this time, what's clustered are those big babies that I showed you in this previous slide. <laughs> now, we, uh, this is as far as, uh, there's about one-tenth, or well, a hundredth maybe, of the size of the universe, and as far as we have any direct evidence that gravitational forces extend. So the Earth's gravitation, if we take the view, has no edge, as you may read in the newspapers when the planet gets outside the field of the gravitation. It keeps on going ever weaker and weaker, inversely as the square of the distance, dividing by four each time you're twice as far away, until it mingles with the strong fields and gets lost in the confusion of the strong fields of other stars but altogether, with the stars in its neighborhood, pulls the other stars to form the galaxy, and altogether they pull on other galaxies to make a pattern, a cluster of galaxies. So the Earth's gravitational field never ends, but peters out very slowly in a precise and careful law, probably to the edges of the universe. The law of gravitation is different than many of the other, well, is, is very important in the economy or in the machinery of the universe. There are many places where gravity has its practical applications as far as the universe is concerned. But 
atypically among all the other laws of physics, gravitation has relatively few practical applications. I mean, the new knowledge of the law, it has a lot of applications, it keeps people in their seats and so on. But it has few, the knowledge of the law has few practical applications, relatively speaking, compared to the other laws. This is one case in which I picked an atypical example. It is impossible, by the way, by picking one example of anything, to avoid picking one which is atypical in some sense. That's the wonder of the world. Isn't it? The only applications I could think of were first in some geophysical prospecting, in predicting the tides. Nowadays, more modernly, in working out the motions of the satellites and uh, the and, uh, planet probes and so on that we send up, and also modernly, to calculate the predictions of the planet's position, which have great utility for astrologers to publish their predictions and horoscopes in the magazines. That's the strange world we live in, that all the advances in understanding are used only to continue the nonsense which has existed for 2,000 years. <laughs> now, the, that shows that gravitation extends to the great distances, but Newton said that everything attracted everything else. Do I attract you? Excuse me, I mean, do I attract you? <laughs> I was going to say, excuse me, do I attract you physically? I didn't mean that. <laughs> What I mean is, to, to, is it really true that two things attract each other? Di can we make a direct test and not just wait for the planets and look at the planets to see if they attract each other? And this experiment, the, the direct test, was made by Cavendish on equipment which you see indicated on the next slide. If I got my slides right. <laughs> well, I made a mistake. I was talking about uh, the, the, the importance of the gravitation. I was overwhelmed by my clever remark about astrologers and forgot to mention the important places where gravitation does have some real effect in the behavior of the universe. And one of the interesting ones is the formation of new stars. In this picture, which is a gaseous nebula inside our own galaxy, and there's not a lot of stars, but it's gas, there are places where the gas has been compressed or attracted to itself here. Uh, it starts, perhaps, by some kind of shock waves to get collected, but the remainder of the phenomenon is that gravitation pulls up the cloud of gas closer and closer together. So big mobs of gas and dust collect and form balls, which, as they fall still further, the heat generated by the falling lights them up, and they become stars. And we have in the next slide some evidence of the creation of new stars. It is, unfortunately, harder to see them.